Welcome everyone to the 31st meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for 2018. Can we please ensure all electronic devices are on silent mode? Um, we have apologies this morning from Annie Wells. Our business today is an oral evidence session with the Minister for Older People and Equalities, Christina McKelvey, MSP. Now, for this session, we asked members of the public for their questions and concerns, and so today we'll be putting their questions to you, Minister. Before we move to those, um, the committee's call for questions received a number of comments about disability and the Department for Work and Pensions. These referred to the overall treatment by the DWP of people with disabilities, work capability assessments and the recent comments of the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Professor Philip Alston. As these issues are not generally within the remit of the committee or the minister before us today, the clerks propose to write to the Social Security Committee um, bringing the comments to their attention and that letter will be posted on our website. I'd like to thank everyone who submitted questions and took the opportunity to engage with us. While we can't get through all the questions that um, we received today, you can still engage with the committee through the normal routes, for example, by taking part in our calls um, for views. So I'd like to welcome Christina McKelvey, Minister for Older People and Equalities, Lisa Bird, Director for Equalities, Human Rights and Third Sector at the Scottish Government, and Duncan Isles, Head of Human Rights Policy at the Scottish Government. As this is the Minister's first evidence session with committee, can I invite her to make an opening statement of up to five minutes? Minister. Uh, thank you very much and good morning committee and uh, thanks for having uh, me back at committee. It feels a bit odd to be at this side of the table but I'm absolutely delighted to be here today in my capacity as Minister for Older People and Equalities and as someone who knows uh, at first hand how uh, important and essential the work of this committee is um, uh, and the vital role that it plays, uh, I'm really pleased to be here too. Um, as you know, the role has recently been advanced by your impressive report on human rights in the Scottish Parliament and I will respond formally uh, but I wanted to take this opportunity opportunity to give an overarching welcome uh, to your recommendations which build directly on existing strengths that we already have in Scotland and that was a really welcome report um, and I'm looking forward to uh, um, responding to it. Um, I was obviously very honoured to serve as convener uh, of this committee and as Minister now with responsibility for both equality and human rights I look forward to be being able to assist the committee today and in the future uh, in the work that we undertake uh, together. But before taking any of your questions, I want to say a few words about my approach to my role and where I believe we are already making a difference. Um, like this committee, I care passionately and uh, uh, passionately about deep-rooted unfairness and disadvantage in our society and I actually came into political life in order to end that unfairness and uh, disadvantage. Um, but while it's important that we're able to identify and describe those issues, this can't be about simply feeling good about caring. What really drives me is making a difference in people's lives and the officials will tell you that my famous cry is outcomes, where's the outcomes? Um, the re reality is that while we have seen some progress and evidence shows that that has not been fast enough or maybe deep enough than it should be and I'm uh, very keen to ensure that that does happen. But above all I want to see improved outcomes in relation to equality and human rights across government and the wider public sector and we we will only achieve that by ensuring that we are listening to the voices of the communities uh, and impacting on their day-to-day -day experience across the range of policy development and service delivery. And that's why your questions from the public are very welcome on that matter. Um, but I am very, very clear that I have an overarching responsibility for pulling together this government's overall focus on equality and human rights. That's the role the First Minister has asked me to undertake. However, I do have um, a very experienced uh, minister ministerial team of colleagues who also care passionately about these issues too and we're working very closely on this. Um, there is much joint ministerial work going on and I'll touch on that in a few minutes. Uh, we will be working uh, with them and I will be working very closely with them to ensure that we are driving change across their area of responsibility as well. And my role is to challenge us all to do better and where necessary to ask the difficult questions, yes, even of my ministerial colleagues. Um, and I do believe that in pressing to make the progress we now need to see across the board, we have some strong examples of areas where we are already making that difference. I am delighted that next week I will be attending a conference to discuss progress um, one year on after the publication of our Race Equality um, Action Plan. 
Uh, one of the most important actions in that plan was the initiation of the Ministerial Working Group on Gypsy Travellers, and I know that's of keen interest to Mary Fee. Um, as the committee and others have highlighted, this is an area where the pace of change has not been enough, uh, and, and what fundamentally we all agree is a human rights issue. But the Ministerial Working Group has brought renewed focus, and I fully expect to be judged on the basis of the actions uh, that we will publish next year. And I'm hoping the new cross-party group is going to help us along the way with that to implement those actions. But related to key areas such as housing, education, employment, and actually when we looked at employment around about Gypsy Travels, it became very, very clear very early on that we needed to change the focus on that a bit and look at the overall issues around poverty, benefits, and everything else as an impact on uh, people's uh, employment outcomes and the lifting people out of poverty. So we changed that focus slightly and we had some great uh, evidence from two women from uh, one of the Gypsy Traveller sites on, on the, the very simple um, challenges that, that come along with that. If they're simple challenges, then they're simple fixes and that's the, the approach that I'm taking. A key aspect of the work in this area has been supporting and listening to the voices directly uh, from Gypsy Traveller communities and I'm particularly pleased that we have been able to directly support women and young people to have their experience heard. The Gypsy Traveller uh, Women Voices Project has just got off the ground and we heard some of it yesterday with the cross-party group. I've got great uh, um, faith in uh, making a difference with that group there. And of course, a young David Donaldson, who we all met at this committee uh, in the work that, that we did when I was on the committee, um, is uh, taking forward the Young People's Assembly and with, with some of the other young people in, in Article 12. Amazing work going on there. Also, the First Minister's advisory group on women and girls and on human rights leadership continue the theme of reaching out to hear voices in new and different ways and challenging us to improve. Both are producing reports for the First Minister and she is considering the recommendations as we speak, I believe. We will continue our strong commitment to take decisive steps forwards towards gender equality and to embed in human rights in Scottish life. On the latter, I am looking forward to attending the major human rights conference being held in the Chamber on Monday by this committee, uh, marking 70 years of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I want to take this opportunity to commend the committee on its work uh, in making this event possible. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly really looking forward to it. Finally, I want to highlight an aspect of the work that I am responsible for, which exemplifies the importance of working with my colleagues in a genuinely cross-cutting way. We will shortly be publishing our final social isolation and loneliness strategy, following a very, very wide range uh, consultation. <clears throat> These are deep-rooted societal issues, and the causes and potential solutions are not just straightforward. But I believe that the strategy that we are producing across government will set a clear direction to make progress and real change in people's circumstances and experiences. All of these examples that I've just given you, and these are only a few, uh, highlight the importance of putting both human rights and equality at the heart of everything we do. And I know that's something that this committee want to do as well, not just with government, but with parliament too. But there is so much more to do. And as the questions uh, that you have received from the public highlight, uh, um, th that demonstrates how important that these issues are. And I'm very happy to take those questions now. Thank you, Minister. Without further ado, we'll move straight on to questions. Alec O'Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. And good morning, Minister. It's nice to welcome you back to the committee. Um, the Minister will be aware that this committee considered the gender representation on Public Board Scotland Bill earlier in this session. In fact, she obviously led the committee through that process. In relation to that Act, John Thompson asked on Twitter, what is the status of the gender representation on Public Boards Bill that passed almost a year ago? And is there any scope for public comments about the specifics of its implementation? Uh, well, the straight, easy answer is yes, um, but I'll go into some detail on that uh, 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 on your question, Mr Cole Hamilton, and thank you for your warm welcome back to committee. As you know, the Act passed in uh, January 2018 after being considered very thoroughly by uh, this committee. It received royal assent in March uh, 2018, and um, well, the, the new regulations, I signed off some of the regulations just very recently. Um, the regulations and the consultation, um, the, sorry, the regulations and the guidance will go out to consultation. So that's why my straight answer to, to Mr. Thompson is absolutely yes. There'll be an opportunity at that point for full public consultation. And I would um, encourage Mr. Thompson and anybody else who has a, an interest in these matters to take part in that consultation. As you know, uh, government wants to ensure that we use the lived experience in all of the policy making that we do now. So Mr Thompson's uh, thoughts and uh, anybody else's thoughts on this will be very welcome indeed. So please look out for the consultation. It will be happening soon and as soon as it does, please uh, raise it with Mr Thompson in order to give him an opportunity to respond. 
Brief up. Um, thank you, Minister. And, and given uh, where we are now, looking back on the bill, is there any gaps? Is there anything that we should have done differently um, with a year's sort of hindsight? Um, I think from my point of view, I, I, I don't think so. Um, however, you know, lots of people have lots of different views and possibly the consultation will throw some of that up. But actually, I'm quite confident that we, we you know, we, we scrutinise this pretty thoroughly uh, when I was at this side of the, the, the table. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty confident that we haven't missed anything. But if anybody thinks that we have, we'd be happy to hear that. OK, we, we're, we're definitely going to get through all the questions. So we're going to be very disciplined in our, in our supplementaries and, and answers. But Gail Ross has some subs. Yeah. Um, thank you, convener. And I'd like to welcome you, Minister, into your new role and back to the committee. It's good to see you. Um, on the um, uh, gender representation on public boards, we did say at the time that we were hoping that it would encourage uh, private boards as well to go down the same lines. Have you seen any progress on that or what can be done to uh, encourage those? Uh, interestingly, um, we, I've Anecdotally, I, I've seen some uh, private companies now, now looking at this um, and how uh, the benefits of having a more diverse board, and that's not just about gender representation, representation it's about having a much more, more diverse board and the, the difference in the additionality that that brings to, to any company. Um, I don't have any um, examples at the top of my head right now, um, but I have seen some of an anecdotal uh, work towards that and, and certainly a lot of uh, conversation and debate going on about the benefits of it. So I would encourage all private companies to go and have a look at the work that we have done in the public sector and use that maybe as a template to take forward uh, more diversity on their boards too. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Mary Fee. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Minister. The public sector equality duty requires public authorities in Scotland to consider equality between protected characteristic groups and potential impacts on them. This question was asked on social media by Scottish women. As the Scottish Government undertakes its review of the public sector equality duty regulations, will the Minister consider what recourse members of the public might have when public authorities fail to have due regard to those with relevant protected characteristics? Yeah, as you'll, you'll know, the, the Scottish Government started recently to look at the public sector equality duty and what more we can do with that and whether it needs updated. So there's a bit of work going on around about that right now and uh, looking at that. One of the, the things we realised very quickly by talking to stakeholders, who I met with uh, all of them over the summer, um, I managed to take the, most of the summer to meet with all of the, the stakeholders across all of my portfolio, but a lot of the, the uh, stakeholders who would have a real interest in this asked for um, some additional time. So we were looking at quite a tight time scale to do this. They asked for the review to be stretched a bit. So we, we agreed to that because we want to you know, hear from people. So uh, we wanted to ensure that they realised we were listening and we were acting on, on the wishes. Um, and we have taken uh, that forward um, in order to ensure that, that we have the, the, the best time. So the provisional timetable for the review will be over 20 19, with possible amending regulations on the basis of the feedback that we have from all the stakeholders coming into force around uh, 2020. Um, this, obviously, at this point, it doesn't uh, stop groups from getting involved in this. We would encourage them to do so, but you, you, you will understand that the, the Equality Acts are, are reserved uh, uh, to Westminster and uh, the duties on them are a matter for the Equality and Human Rights Committee. We know that it's not a statutory requirement. Um, uh, to do the review, but we decided to review elements in relation to devolved matters. Um, and as I say, stakeholders have asked us for more time and we are, we are, we are about to do that. Um, you may also know that Scottish ministers have no powers to enforce. Um, we would possibly quite like those powers, um, and we've, but we have no powers to enforce either the public sector equality duty generally or the specific duties in particular, um, and the compliance process is set out, and I can ensure that the committee is given the link to the compliance process so that you can inform the, your questioner uh, as, as to where they can go to get some of that information. Um, but at this point in time, uh, specifically, we, we uh, don't hold the power over that aspect of it. That is the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and we would direct, direct your questioners and possibly the committee to the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Thank you, um, Minister. That was a very helpful answer and hopefully that will um, answer the question that, that, that was posed. Could I perhaps also um, ask the Minister if she could update us on the Scottish Government's work to incorporate the UN rights of the child? Um, and if, perhaps if the Minister could give us a bit more detail around the First Minister's group on human rights leadership? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you know, we, we've we've made a commitment in, in the PFG and in uh, uh, other ways to, and the First Minister has given the commitment to incorporate the principles of, of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. That work is obviously going on a pace right now. It's work that's been undertaken by my colleague, uh, Marie Todd, um, and maybe it would be an opportunity for you to have a deeper conversation with her. On, on the First Minister's advisory group, uh, Professor uh, Alan Miller has been working very closely, and I know that he's worked closely with the committee too, in order to bring about um, some of his recommendations. The First Minister told him to be bold. He reassures me that he has been bold. Whether that presents certain challenges for, for us uh, in government, I'm sure it will, but there will be challenges, I think, that will, they will be worth undertaking. As you know, um, the First Minister uh, is considering the recommendations now, and uh, Professor Miller, I think, will publish his report uh, at your event on, on Monday. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what he's got to say. And I believe the First Minister will make some initial, initial um, responses to that on Monday. So um, to prevent me from cutting across the very uh, important job the First Minister has to do, because it is her advisory council, that's maybe all I've got to say on that right now. But I'm really looking forward to Monday uh, to hearing what both Professor Miller and the First Minister has to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Minister, in, in, in terms of the public sector um, equality duty, it was um, raised with me actually only yesterday that there might be some issues around data, um, particularly um, around um, race as a protected um, characteristic. Do you or your officials have any reflections on um, what we can do to better improve the quality of data that lets or bodies assess the outcomes of, of the policies that they're, they're implementing? Okay, I, I've not had that feedback. I've managed to meet with Bemis and Crayer um, over a number of occasions in the past few months, and I've not had that feedback from those organisations. So if that's a specific issue, I would be keen for you to write to me on that because we'd want to sort that out. We're obviously looking at the first year's review of the, the Race Equality Action Plan. And if there's an issue in there about how we collect data, especially if we go forward in the review of the public sector equality duty and what that means for public authorities and their responsibilities and the rights uh, of people to, to access their rights in that, that sense, I would be very keen to hear from the committee on uh, the specifics of that. We can do that. Oliver, you a quick supplementary. Quick supplementary. I just wanted to return to uh, the UN rights of the child. Um, and just ask the Minister whether she was aware of any consideration that had taken place of the draft bill that the Children's Commissioner uh, and others had uh, suggested to Scottish Government Ministers, and whether there was any work ongoing on that. Uh, my quick answer is I'm not sure, uh, because that will be Marie Todd that will be taking forward that work. So if you allow me to consult with my uh, ministerial colleagues, I can come back to you on that. Yeah. Very helpful. Thank you. OK. Um, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener, and again, good morning, Minister Panel. Um, we're going to go on to uh, gender recognition legislation now. A number of questions were asked in relation to gender, sex, the rights of women, the rights of trans people, and reform of the Gender Recognition Act. The Scottish Government recently consulted on a review of the Gender Recognition Act. A majority of people responding to that consultation supported proposals to introduce self declaration for legal gender recognition. However, concerns were also raised about women's safety, in particular about the potential for such a system to be open to exploitation and abuse by men, allowing them access to women's spaces such as refuges and women's prisons, and where they could potentially cause harm. These concerns were also raised by those who submitted questions to the Minister. Can the Minister comment on the concerns raised regarding the safety and rights of women under a system of self-declaration? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, thanks for the question. It's a, a very good question and um, we it completely understand some of the concerns that are being raised here. We had 15,000 odd responses uh, to uh, the consultation, some very detailed responses in that too. And the proposal within the consultation is to shift away from a medical diagnosis uh, in order to gain a gender recognition certificate to a, a more uh, social uh, diagnosis in that sense. Um, wouldn't be a diagnosis, sorry, it's probably the very long wrong word to use, but away from the medical model uh, anyway. Um, the consultation proposed a new system, um, and under this, a person seeking gender uh, recognition would continue to make a statutory de declaration. So you couldn't just flip 
back, back and forward because the statutory dec declaration has to take um, uh, place um, in, in front of a notary public or a justice of the peace. It's a solemn um, act in, in that sense. Um, and actually something, if it's abused and there's been a false declaration made, it would be a serious criminal offence with um, a, a sentence of up to two years uh, for someone who would maybe abuse that system. So I would hope that would reassure people that this is not just that you know you can flip back and forward to, 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 to suit you, that it's actually a serious declaration that you have to make in front of both either a notary to the public or a justice of the peace, and it's a very um, solemn uh, oath to take. Um, the other thing is about risk assessments. Now, the Equality Act currently allows exceptions um, uh, in, in uh, women-only spaces, whether that's refugees or prisons, and uh, women's organisations in the prison service use these uh, all, all the time. So those exceptions currently exist. There is no um, proposal to change that. So those risks would always be assessed based on individual need and individual risk, therefore um, minimising any um, fear uh, that that would happen. Now, the Equality Act is reserved to Westminster, and the Westminster Government have, have already informed us that they have no intention of changing that part of it. So that proposal will still be uh, in place the way it is now. So those risk assessments would be ta ta taken on individual risk, individual need, uh, therefore there should be um, limited uh, scope for any abuse uh, in women-only spaces in that sense. So can you pinpoint, for, for the people that are worried, what is the exact change? It's just uh, making it easier for a birth certificate to be amended, is that correct? There's no other changes to things like, because we've had um, representations about things, for, uh, for example, sports, prisons, as you said, refuges, um, and, and so many other things that are already happening at the moment. There's no changes to any of these things at all. The, exception, the exemptions that currently exist under the Equality Act will remain in place. So all of those fears, and I understand that they are legitimate fears that people have, uh, sh shouldn't materialise. Obviously, we can't legislate risk completely away, but if we take the approach that, that, that we have taken thus far, um, I, I suspect that those risk assessments will remain robust. Uh, we, we're attempting to take the most inclusive approach uh, uh, to this as we possibly can. And the, the main issue uh, for, for, for trans people is whether they need a medical certificate or not. The main change is that you wouldn't need the medical certificate, but you would still need to go through the formal declaration procedure, which is an oath in front of a notary public or a justice of the peace. Um, we have uh, another uh, supplementary minister. Concerns have also been raised about the guidance issued by the Equality and Human Rights Commission on the provision of single sex services. It was highlighted that the guidance is inconsistent with the Commission's response to the, UK's, the UK government's consultation on the Gender Recognition Act. Lisa McKenzie asked if the Minister feels that the Commission's guidance is sufficiently clear and if it's well understood by organisations that wish to offer or do offer single-sex services. Yeah. In the earlier answer, and I had explained for the public sector equality duty that the Equality and Human Rights Commission is a reserved body. Um, therefore, I think if the UK government are not making any changes here, there'll be no changes uh, made there either. Um, and I think the specific concerns around about the, the guidance um, may be raised directly with the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission. But as I said in the earlier answer, if there's no changes proposed and the exceptions that protect women and women-only spaces right now, um, I, I, I don't see how the risk would be increased. Um, however, you know, uh, maybe the Equality and Human Rights Commission would be the best person to answer you on their guidance. Their guidance is for them and the UK government is not, not for me. Thank you. Alec. Thank you, convener. Um, the intersectionality around this issue is quite stark, and I struggle to think of a, an equalities issue where tensions between equalities groups are as fraught as they are with this. And we've seen uh, protests at Pride for the first time this year and, and other events like that. Um, I wonder, can the minister um, tell us about any international examples where other nations have already embraced this, have already uh, travelled this road, and whether there are learning points for how we win hearts and minds of people who have have understandable anxiety about this, but at the same time that we uh, achieve progress for our trans citizens. 
Yeah, um, not off the top of my head um, can I think of any. You've really caught me out here, Mr Cole-Hamilton, which is always, you're always tricky, aren't you? You're always tricky. Um, off the top of my head, any in international examples? I know that officials uh, who are working on this and the Cabinet Secretaries leading on the, the, the proposals and the reform of the Act are, are doing a lot of work to look at areas where we can learn from. Um, you're absolutely right. There is people who do have very le legitimate concerns and fears around this. Our role is to try and find the information and the, the examples that, that maybe allay some of those fears and, and do the job of reassuring uh, people that any risk that they feel uh, is there, that we can minimise that as much as we can. And I would hope they would be reassured assured by the actions this morning. I can certainly go and look at international uh, um, or ask the officials who are working with the CABSEC to look at um, the international examples and come back to you with some of those, if that would be helpful. I would be very grateful if yeah, you could. Yeah, I yeah. think um, you mentioned yourself that there were 16,000 responses to the consultation, and I think that itself is symptomatic of the mobilisation on both sides of the argument that, that sort of went with that. And um, so this issue has the potential to be very divisive. Um, I would like very much to learn uh, from the experience of other countries about how we can heal those divisions, how we can find a, a, a progressive and uh, reasonable path forward, which achieves the goals that I think we all share on this committee, but heeds the anxieties from, from those other communities. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Gail, you had a brief supplementary. Thank you, Convener. Just um, quickly, Minister, um, there's been a lot of chat across social media and people have actually come to see me as well. And one of the prevailing perceptions is that this is going to somehow erode women's rights. I wonder if you could put people's minds at rest about that. Um, I'll be the last person in government who will ever allow anything to erode to women's rights in government uh, on that. That's not to put aside the fact that some people do have legitimate complaints and, and issues. We are taking all of that into account. Um, there was a very, very clear and detailed responses in the consultation, some of them uh, from international um, a, a people as well who had, had, had some great support for the, the scheme and others who had some uh, concerns about it. So we've taken all of that on board. My, my reassurance would be that we would not be um, undermining any women's rights in Scotland at all. If anything, we would be making our nation much more inclusive uh, and understanding of the differences and diversities that we all enjoy. Thanks. Minister, um, some, one of the concerns raised was around the conflation of, of sex and gender. Do you have any comments on that? Because I suppose that the, the, the fear in terms of diminishing women's rights might be around how we define women. And Alec Cole-Hamilton talked about intersexuality and obviously, um, sectionality, sorry. <laughs> obviously, all the qualities are equal. There's, there's no um, hierarchy there. So that you know, an answer to that question might reassure people. Yeah, no, I think I think you're absolutely right. And, and the, the term sex and gender uh, on in lots of uh, documents and policy over the years has been interchangeable. So we don't see the, the two things as very, very separate. There's an argument about biological sex, and that's a scientific argument, and that's, that's fair enough. But when it comes to equalities and equalities policy, sex and gender have always been pretty in, interchangeable in that, that sense. Um, and we, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see much a, a, a issue with this. There's a clear understanding uh, the protected characteristics in, in the Equality Act are, are on sex and the hate crime legislation has, or the hate crime review, has thrown up some issues around about gender and misogyny and how, how we deal with that. I think what we need is some really clear factual uh, understanding of, of this and how we can take that forward. And, and we're working uh, very, very closely with the stakeholders in order to get some of that clarity, um, because I think some of it has been uh, a bit confused and we need to make sure that we have uh, a much clearer and um, factual response to some of those arguments. We're working on that as we speak. Okay, uh, full to McGregor. Good morning, uh, good morning Minister and, and panel. I've got a question here for, from Julie van den Driesch, um, and it is, what do you have in place to ensure children suffering from invisible disabilities and their families are fully supported? Do you have any plans to fund advocacy services to ensure all children are able to make the most of their early opportunities and not fall through the cracks. Yeah, as, uh, Mr uh, uh, McGregor will know this is an issue that's been close to my heart for a very, very long time. I was instrumental in um, uh, ensuring that the autism strategy ca came into place and was very uh, pleased to, to launch it in 2011. Um, it, my former colleague, uh, Hugh O'Donnell, who's a Central Scotland uh, Lib Dem MSP, worked very hard with me on that in the 
first session we were in Parliament. You'll know that um, the Getting It Right for Every Child is our national strategy, and that underpins everything that, that we do. Um, our um, proposal and our, our, our ambition is that every child would reach their full potential, irrespective of the barriers and the challenges that they have in that. And all of the learning environments uh, it should be meeting children's needs. Um, and whether that's in a mainstream school, whether it's in a special school, whether it's other flexible learning uh, examples. For instance, in the Gypsy Traveller uh, community we have um, in Murray, we have a, a bus uh, that provides education. So we're looking at all of the flexible uh, opportunities across that. But you know, it should be based on a child's need and, and, and what, what they need to do to thrive and um, flourish at school. Um, I'm working very closely right now with Marie Todd on how we support young people with disabilities in school at transition points, which I know you will understand is sometimes the most difficult stages, you know, nursery to primary, primary to secondary, secondary into further higher education or uh, into uh, workplaces or into adult services. So we're currently working on uh, a better strategy and how to make that much more seamless. We are speaking to parents and, and stakeholders on that uh, in order to make that difference. So I know that there are key elements where uh, no doubt the, the, the question or, uh, was, was keen uh, to, to understand as well. But you're absolutely right about how do we make that all happen in schools. So there's a number of ways we make that happen right now. Better joined up uh, working between social work and social care departments and schools. Better um, understanding um, and uh, uh, support for uh, the staff who work in school, and that's not just the teachers. Um, when it comes to teacher uh, education, there's a uh, new uh, um sections in the, the initial teacher education training. There is consistent and in, 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 uh, uh, currently um, CPD going on with uh, teachers who have been through uh, their initial teacher training. And that's to help teachers to identify the challenges, to come up with the strategies and the opportunities to support a young person. And currently, teachers and um, some young people are helping redesign uh, some of the products and um, frameworks and resources that are currently used in school so in order to do that. We are also working with universities to explore how we increase the understanding of disabilities and the impact on learning uh, in order for teachers to uh, ensure that they can support young people better and to give teachers the confidence and the tools that they need in order to take that forward. One of the questions you asked about was about um, strategies and um, a, examples of uh, advocacy. You, you'll know that we fund uh, Enquire, uh, which is one of the, the organisations um, to support parents and children. You will know that um, any person with a mental health issue under the Mental Health Care and Treatment Act has a right to independent advocacy. You'll also know that NHS boards are funding, well, I hope you know this, <laughs> uh, but I think you do, uh, NHS boards are funding the Scottish Independent Advisory Alliance, which has been central at, at supporting young people to make their own decisions, uh, as well as supporting everyone around them. Um, and as you know, advocacy, for me, advocacy services are central to ensuring that young people realise their human rights and families realise their rights to a, a good, fruitful and um, a, um, education. Um, we're looking at how we can make more um, of this information available and there's publications uh, going up on the, the children's advocacy uh, guidance uh, is all up uh, on uh, a link and I can provide that to the committee as well that will give you some information. And the, the Scottish Independent Advisory Alliance recently published guidance for independent advocacy organisation and independent advocacy Oh, too many independent advocacies there. Advocates uh, when working with children and young people. And that guidance is, is currently publicly available too. Some of the things that I realise in the work that I do when I'm working with families who have got children with disabilities going through school, invisible or otherwise, is that um, they're not sure where all of this information is. And I think we've got a job of work to do to make sure that they understand where all of this information is, how they can use that information, how they can have access to an independent advocate, advocate to realise the, the rights and um, the, the best way to make the, the learning experience for that young person the best learning experience that it can be. So, there's a whole host of work going on, most of it being led by my colleague Marie Todd, but some of it being led by both of us in order to deal with some of the real pertinent challenges around about transitions.
Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Minister. Oh, sorry. We have a, a couple of supplementaries, so um, if we could have them uh, quite concise um, questions and answers, that would be great. Thank you, Fulton. All oh, right, okay. Sorry, I thought somebody else was going to. Um, uh, thanks very much for that response, Minister. And, uh, and you can tell, even uh, in the way you answered, uh, the way you answered that your passion for this area and the, uh, the, the work that you've put into over the years. Um, I've had a couple of uh, constituents recently. Um, who have got um, children who are autistic or, or, or grandchildren who are autistic uh, and they've been quite concerned about um, their access to health services and, and, and the, the, the delays. Um, is that something you'd, you'd wish to comment on? How do you think health boards can improve in that area? Well, I suppose the, the honest answer is that some of this can be quite inconsistent. Uh, and one of the things that the Scottish Government worked on was the autism toolbox, which can be used across uh, lots of public authorities. And that allows uh, uh, identif identification um, of need and uh, support and planning in order to put that in into place. Um, the autism strategy is obviously a 10-year 10, 10 strategy, and we're, we're, we're coming close to the, to the end of that. Um, if there's clear examples of where that's not worked uh, in possible um, referrals to CAMS for diagnosis, and I suspect that's because I've had the same cases as you, no doubt, um, referrals to CAMS, but I have seen you know, smashing uh, examples of that, and then I've seen some challenging examples of that as well. That's usually when uh, um, individual cases are a bit more complicated uh, and how we do that. If there's specific issue around about how that's been conducted uh, either locally or nationally and you have some evidence of that I, I would be keen to hear it and I could then have conversations with my health colleagues and how we address some of that would that be reassuring yeah. yes um, I'll be very quick and ask two quick questions in one uh, does the minister given our concern and interest in autism I feel that the not included not engaged uh, not not involved I uh, report is, 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 a, is a cause for, for alarm for, for a lot of uh, families and what is she doing to help uh, end unlawful exclusion of, of young people from school and secondly uh, looking at my own local area uh, does the minister think it's acceptable uh, for parents and children to be waiting for three to five years to get an autism diagnosis? Um, uh, thanks very much Mr Mundo for that, that question. Um, the, you, you'll know that there's, there's been a response uh, from the Cabinet Secretary for Health on, on some of the issues in the report. Um, obviously, it was concerning for, for all of us. There is work currently ongoing to look at how, how we do that better. Um, I think, and I'm pulling this for the back of my head, that Professor Anne Donaldson has done some work on uh, placements out with Scotland, which was one of the, the issues that, that was uh, brought up, especially around about young people with, with learning disabilities or, or autism. Um, my reassurance to you is that there is work going on right now. I can bring you back some more information on that, and I'm sure that, that will be helpful. On waiting times, I don't think anybody would be happy with a waiting time uh, for that length of, of time. And again, that I'd be happy to liaise with my uh, ministerial colleagues if you've got a specific you know, geographical issue there that we can attempt to address. Be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Fee. Thank you, um, Convener. We're going to move on to disability and accessibility now, Minister. Um, and we, we received a number of questions around accessibility. And my, my question is rather a long one, but it does reflect all of the issues that have been raised with us. Um, Taryn Cotton asked about accessibility in public transport, pavements, retailers, and the provision of disabled toilets. Theresa Corner and Robert Duff asked about the enforcement of blue badges and pavement parking. Catherine Kalzika pointed out that a lack of disabled changing facilities can prevent those with disabilities and their carers from being involved in their community. Mary Batchelor Clive said, these may be small things, but they have a large impact on our daily lives. What is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that disabled people are not prevented from being able to participate in activities or undertake routine tasks such as shopping due to inaccessible buildings and a lack of appropriate transport? 
Absolutely. Um, can I agree with uh, the questioner, Mary, who says that these may be small things, but they have a great impact? I absolutely agree. I, I understand that uh, uh, very clearly. Um, you will maybe know that the Fairer Scotland for Disabled People Strategy uh, and Action Plan has been published. We've got five long-term ambitions in that and 93 individual actions. And within those actions, a whole host uh, of, of issues in there. So let, let me go through about uh, accessibility, public transport, um, you've just reminded me something else in my head there. Wait a minute. I'm going to tell you a wee story about something in a minute. Um, it, but let, let's look at some of the, the, the strategies that are available to people in or, order to change some of this. And there's a real commitment within the 93 individual actions to do this. You may realise in the chamber a few weeks ago, Liz Smith asked me a question about Purple Tuesday, which was a, a, an event organised um, to uh, increase accessibility to shopping. Coming up to Christmas, people want to get out uh, and do their shopping and how we can get out and meet uh, people in our local communities better. Uh, my response to Liz Smith was that we welcomed Purple Tuesday, but we wanted to make sure that Purple Tuesday was every day uh, and ensuring that people have that be better access. Um, and we're doing some work on that. Um, I'm going to meet with her soon uh, to discuss uh, some of the challenges with people like Ewan's Guide. Um, now, Ewan's Guide is very, very close to my heart because I uh, supported the event here to launch Ewan's Guide and to see it going from strength to strength. And that's a guide that's informed by uh, by disabled people, for disabled people, on where the best places are to go, where the accessibility is. It's a very, very positive one, but obviously it reviews everything. So within that, you see some of the negative reviews and some of the challenges that people have in accessing either the town centres or shops or theatres or, or whatever. So uh, we're working very closely with them in or, order uh, to make sure that that goes from strength to strength and continue, continues to do that. So that's one part. The other part is around about public buildings and accessibility and how we can make sure that we can do that. Obviously, older buildings, it's a bit more difficult to retrofit that, but I don't think it's beyond the realms of imagination to make sure that they can be retrofitted to do that. And you will know that the Fairer Scotland for Disabled People uh, um, strategy um, has it's, it's an actual action in it that says places that are accessible to everyone. And, and that's not just maybe about people who have disabilities, it's about how uh, a a community can grow as a community grows older as well. So if you may, you get older, you're a bit frail, you've got dementia, you know how that's all friendly and inclusive for everyone. So there's some specific actions in the action plan around that. Um, the other uh, issue is about um, accessible toilets and how we can do more of that. And there's a bit of work being done on that right now. We're working very closely with PAMIS, who are the gold standard in, in all of this. And I've got two quick stories to tell you. One is about uh, public uh, accessibility, public toilets. There's a family uh, locally that I know who drop that the, they drop their dad off on a Sunday night at Glasgow Airport and pick him back up on the Friday night every week because he works uh, uh, abroad. And one of the, their children, the youngest one, has um, a cerebral palsy. And there was no real decent facility at Glasgow Airport. So that mum campaigned alongside uh, others. And I was able to go along. And very, one of my very first duties, and people would say, you opened a toilet. Actually, it was life-changing for that family because Glasgow Airport stepped up and came up to the mark, consulted with Palmas, and got one of the best facilities that I think I have ever seen. Now, that's an example of a private company that can do that. And if we can all do that, then we should be, we should be doing it. And public buildings, well, there's obviously a responsibility under the public sector quality duty to ensure that we've got more of these. And there is work ongoing. Please reassure your questioners that there's work ongoing uh, to do that. And Glasgow Airport's a perfect example of that. The other issue was about just getting to places, being connected, um, using public transport, where that public transport is accessible, and you know that most of it is now. But another story that I'm going to tell you is about a visit I did in the summer down to Gala Shields, to the Gala Wheels project, who were a small community transport project. All of us nod his head because they're absolutely amazing. Um, and they had just managed to raise some funds to get one of the big all sing and all dancing buses with all the different hoists and lifts and everything. What that did was open up a whole world for people who couldn't uh, maybe use other modes of transport and they are now using that. And some of that um, support comes from the Scottish Government. We have a fund to train, train the volunteer drivers to do that. So in some cases, public transport might not be the answer for someone because it doesn't address the need, whereas funding for community transport links like that does address the need. And I was hearing a great story uh, from one of the, the organisers to say that they take a trip into Edinburgh they take a full bus into Edinburgh. A lot of the people don't come back with any shopping. 
because they just go for the journey, they go for the connectedness, they go uh, to deal with maybe if they're, they're facing some social isolation and loneliness, and they use the community transport link to do that. So lots going on. It's, it's maybe never enough uh, to make the, the, the pace of change that we want to make, but we would hope that when it all comes together and using the strategy and the 93 actions that we will see uh, real progress uh, in the near future. That, um, very full and helpful answer. Um, before I move on to the specific um, supplementary that's been um, sent in to us, I wanted just to pick up on the issue of accessible toilets, um, because I'm sure the Minister will be aware of the recent amendment I got through the, the planning legislation to ensure that all new public buildings and stadiums and shopping centres have a changing places toilet because there, there is a, a, quite a, a difference between a disabled toilet and a changing places toilet. Changing places toilets have um, hoists which enable people with more profound disabilities to, to, you know, to, to be able to go out. But there is the issue of the, the many, many hundreds of buildings that currently do not have a changing places toilet. Um, and, and I would be grateful if the Minister could perhaps um, give us some idea about what kind of work the government will do, because retrofitting um, a, a current disabled toilet into a changing places toilet isn't that, that big a job. Is the government considering any work and perhaps putting enough fund to an, allow retrofitting? So we've got the budget next week, uh, uh, Mary, and you'll understand that um, it's, it's a difficult process to go through. Uh, so, you know, putting that on the table is, is, is there. Um, in full view. Um, there's already work going on. After I seen uh, the, what happened at Glasgow Airport uh, and had some representations from pa PAMIS and other organisations about the work that we can do, your amendment, very helpfully going through uh, in the planning bill, has added some uh, impetus to that. So we have got some work ongoing um, and we are you know, looking at how we can fund some of that. There may be more innovative ways of funding it as well, especially when it comes to, to maybe business or public sector business as well. So let me let me have a look at the, the, the you know the progress we've made on that, um, and come back to you on it so that I can update update you then. I, I'm sure we've got things to say, but I'm not sure whether I can say it yet. <laughs> so, that's very helpful. Thank you. Can, can I, Mary, can I just come back to you on blue badges? Because mm -hmm. I, knew, I know that I've been in there. Um, obviously, blue badges, we keep that under review all the time when we've just done, done the review and extended that a bit. Um, there has been a call for some reform on this, and Transport Scotland are currently looking at that. So I'm just awaiting then coming back to me with some information on uh, some of the proposals that are in that, and I can come back to you on blue badges too. Thank you very much. Um, Marion Barnett has asked us that uh, due to the inaccessibility of certain local public buildings, she is unable to participate in local democracy. What steps can the Scottish Government take to ensure that people with disabilities are not denied the opportunity for political participation? This, this is a really interesting one because, when I, when, you know, it's, 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 there, there shouldn't be... Uh, a case where the, a building was inaccessible, there should have been provision made to make it accessible or at least the services within it accessible to, to that person. So that's obviously a very particular thing. I would hope, uh, uh, Miss, Mrs Marion Barnett, did you say? Uh, I would hope that uh, she would maybe be contacting her local uh, MSP and asking uh, for some uh, support in that, especially if it's a public building. Absolutely. So that, that's my, my first thing. On political participation, um, per se. We're doing quite a lot. Um, you'll know that Inclusion Scotland, uh, along funded with the Scottish Government, is doing the uh, internship programme, and I suspect many of you have had interns. I've had one myself. And for the UND of Persons with Disabilities last week, I went to meet some of the interns to see uh, where they are now and the work that they're doing and the progress that they're making. And it was just fantastic. Um, this you know, a very simple, um, a, you know, partnership piece of working has created so many opportunities, opened up uh, the world uh, to people, giving them the right support. And what was really heartening, because I asked some of the tough questions, but <laughs> is your boss good to you? Do they look after you? Do you feel part of the team? You know, some of the things that can be the real, the biggest challenges and, and, and the biggest barriers. And they all had fantastic things to say. They were not all without some challenges, but they were able, with the right support, to address those challenges and to see that happening in that internship programme is amazing. And that's a political shadowing programme. Uh, so it allows people to think about whether they want to become politically active. And you would think when someone's got that amazing lived experience, whether they would want to be that political active um, and, and bring some of that experience to politics, which would be absolutely wonderful. That You'll know that the... Um, the participation, I'm trying to remember the, to the name of it now, but the participation and elections fund that the Scottish Government brought forward last year, I think there was um, 
30 odd people supported through that and I think 15 of them got elected so again another very simple way uh, to ensure that we open up all the horizons and open up the opportunities for uh, people with disabilities to get involved in policy making. Um, a few weeks ago I was along at a partners and policy makers uh, conference where there's a funded program for um, parents of children with disabilities to take part in policy making to uphold their human rights and to be champions for those human rights and again you know another great example of of the work we can do very simple good partnership good collaboration good support and it creates so many amazing opportunities and i hope to see some of these 15 who were elected the last time in this parliament the next time thank you oliver mandel a question, this is question six. Um, what uh, action is uh, the Scottish Government to, taking to ensure that everyone has the right to adequate housing in Scotland? Um, in particular, uh, social media user JHF uh, asked about the difficulties people who have been involved in the criminal justice face when they're trying to access this right. Uh, you'll, know, you'll know that... Um Rehabilitation back in, uh, into the community if you've been uh, part of this uh, criminal justice system can, can, can be quite a tough one um, for people. Uh, we would hope it would be a tough one when they come in contact with public, uh, the public sector and public authorities who have a responsibility to, to house and look after people. We have some of the, the most advanced housing legislation in the world and we're currently reviewing that again um, to ensure that people get the opportunities that you need. You will not be surprised, Mr Mundell, when I tell you that Mr Stewart, uh, Kevin Stewart, is, is leading uh, on all of this and uh, especially working very very hard through the, the planning bill and the work that's going on right now you will maybe also know that the fairer uh, scotland for disabled people uh, strategy has actions in those 93 actions that i mentioned earlier specifically housing related ones and that was to ensure that local authorities set realistic targets um, for new builds and, and Mary's very helpful amendment will ensure that that, that uh, focus is, is, is even sharper now. But set targets that create flexible housing opportunities that ensure that, that, that these um, opportunities are accessible. Obviously retrofit in old homes is sometimes more difficult but if we can build out into the system and build out of the system the barriers that people have then you would have more flexible uh, um, housing opportunities to do that. The, Local authorities have a duty on them to report annually to the Scottish Government on the progress made, um, and we can get you the, the most up-to-date annual report on that if it would help you. There's also wheelchair accessible guidance to local authority, which will be available early in 2019. So again, another action uh, um, in relation to Federal Scotland for disabled people, and we can get you that guidance as soon as it's made available. There's also a refreshment of the local housing strategy guidance, which will be expected early next year too. So both of these things should come along about the same time. And that's to enable um, local authorities to uh, take cognizance at the planning stage, how we build out the barriers uh, and create those more flexible situations. Um, where flexible building uh, actually meets the needs uh, of people. Well, that's happened already in new builds already. 91% of um, the 2016-17 new builds actually met the housing variant needs standards. So we're already getting to a stage with new builds where we're getting, you know, we're making real progress here. With the guidance, uh, both pieces of guidance that will be out in the new year um, or early next year, um, uh, we should be making much more progress towards this. And I think the, the amendment in the planning bill again gives that renewed focus. That's uh, excellent. Thank you. I think that covers a lot of the supplementary questions that um, people have, have asked as well. Um, I just asked a very short question of my own. I, I'm, I, I'm conscious that we want to get through all the public's questions, so I was going to pause members' one. ones. We've got two more to get through, so I'm just I'm just alerting uh, you and the minister to that because I know we'll want to have responses to all the all the public's questions. Uh, okay, um, I just maybe just put a comment to the minister, and she can maybe get back to me separately to this just round particular problems in uh, rural communities where uh, the social housing stock and otherwise doesn't make you know, mean that there's a lot there's not a lot of alternatives available to people and just what financial provision there is for people to adapt uh, their, their own existing home okay um, can I speak to mr. Stewart on those specifics about um, your, your particular geographical area and come back to you then I'd be happy to do that thank you thank you Ross Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm going to move on now to older people, Minister, and there has been much discussion in the media recently of an intergenerational divide between young and old. 
on everything from housing to Brexit, as an example, earlier this year, the new statesman described baby boomers versus millennials as the defining schism in UK politics. And in April, the observer asked, millennials are struggling. Is it the fault of baby boomers? Colette Gregg asked on Facebook, what is planned to prevent the division between young and old, which appears to be encouraged on all of the media? It is negative and serves no real purpose other than to cause anger, particularly from the young. Can the minister comment on what work is being undertaken in Scotland to foster positive intergenerational relationships? Yeah, I certainly, certainly can. Um, this, th this narrative of uh, them versus us and who's to blame is incredibly, incredibly unhe unhelpful. However, we are taking some steps to, to deal with that. Um, we believe uh, that older people, being the minister for, for older people, but not defined by it, obviously, um, is that we older people make a, a positive contribution. They bring their wisdom, they bring their experience, they bring their life experience uh, to, to all of the, the, the work that we do. Uh, in, in, you know, in creating the, the society we, we, we want to be. We're all getting older. Uh, our population is get, getting older as well. So we, we've got some uh, real um, demographic challenges to, to face in the future. Uh, so in order to ensure that we can face those challenges and maybe not come up against too many, is to create the narrative that it's positive, it's wise, it's lived experience, and it's, it's that uh, experience that we want to uh, keep in, in everything that we do. Um, I would hope that the uh, about £590,000 uh, that we have uh, committed to older people's organisations to tackle the barriers will be a way to do that. Uh, and, and the framework around that is all about positivity, it's all about the positive contribution, and it's all about working together across generations. Uh, we, we fund an organisation called Generations Working Together in order to, to do some of this, this work, and they do fantastic work. If you can get an opportunity to go in your constituencies to see the work they do, please do it. You will be absolutely uh, gratified. I had a brilliant experience in, in my constituency and doing that. But one of the things that, 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 that the older people's organisations, when they're tackling the barriers, look at is, is about independent living, is about maintaining that independence in your community, in your household uh, and in your family for as long as possible, promoting people's rights and the equality around about that. That can only be positive and should always be framed in a, in a positive way. We have the Older People's uh, Strategic Action Forum, which is chaired by me now. Um, and recently, we uh, freed up about £50,000 for the OPSAF members and organisations to help inform the work that we are doing on the framework. And that takes me to the actual piece of work that we're doing in order to address all of this. The Older People's Framework, um, we hope, will be published around about springtime. Um, the Older People's Framework focuses on uh, a few key elements. Positive contributions is at the very top. Removing barriers um, is there, and ending negative perceptions uh, is, is there too. And in order to inform some of that work, I went uh, up to visit Hanover Housing Project in Elgin, um, who have just built a new uh, housing uh, development, which is not just for older people. There's some people in there with some disabilities, mental health issues, learning disabilities, all living together in the community. And it's a beautiful new build, fully accessible, fabulous um, facility. But in the centre is a courtyard, and the courtyard was gorgeous. I like gardens, so the court. And I, I was like, how is the courtyard so nice? And then they showed me why it was so nice. Because next door is the nursery school, and the kids from the nursery come in and look after the garden. And they go in the chap everybody's door saying, come and help us sort out the hydrangeas. And they were giving me all these Latin names for the, the plants as well. But it was a perfect example of what we can do when we bring together the framework and we have generations working together. We end all that negative perception. We bring all that wisdom and lived experience back in to young people's lives. We hopefully give them something that, that they can aspire to because when they hear some of the stories of the lived experience of maybe the older generation, they can say, I could do that or I could maybe uh, be involved in that. But to see that really key uh, uh, intergenerational work was a real joy and that's what we're focusing on and that's where we want to get to. Um, so much for that answer. Um, I, I guess the strategies that you just mentioned um, 
would protect the social rights of older people in Scotland as well. Um, for example, the right to education and the right to take part in a, a cultural life as well. Could you maybe expand on that, please? No, absolutely. And the, the framework look, looks at all of that. And, and again, another anecdotal story, because I think when you put a human face on, on policy, you, you can see it in action. And a recent visit on the, the day of the UN Day of Older Persons, uh, I went along to Queen's Cross Housing Association in Glasgow, who have got the most amazing community link worker set up there. And I met a group of older people, and, and some people who were socially isolated and lonely within a tenement block, but hadn't spoken to people for years, who have used the community link worker team to bring them back, to give them a, a new outlook in life, to uh, you know help them uh, upgrade their actual homes, uh, to deal with some of the health issues that they have. But one amazing thing was every single one of them were registered at the local college, didn't matter what age they were. And I had a fantastic hand massage from an old lady who has decided after all these years that she She's going back to college and taking full advantage of her student discount card. <laughs> Thank you. Minister, um, the Young Women and Lead Committee report into sexual harassment in schools highlighted that 91% of their focus group participants considered sexual harassment or gender-based bullying to be a problem at their school. The report also noted that more than half of girls aged 13 to 21 think that those who report sexual harassment may be bullied or teased. So on your um, portfolio responsibility for women and gender equality, Twitter user Scottish Women asked, what are the minister's views that sexual harassment and sexist bullying of schoolgirls were not explicitly named within the respect for all anti-bullying guidance? Can she guarantee these incidents will be accurately recorded and monitored in order to tackle it? Yeah. Can I pay tribute to the Young Women Lead uh, Project and the work that they've done, because it's, it's informing all of the work that I'm doing in this area. I can also pay tribute to the Girl Guides, who came and seen this committee during the prejudice-based bullying um, a, a inquiry that we undertook here, uh, who came and seen us in private first to talk about some of the issues that they had experienced and then felt confident enough to go on the public record. And some of that was absolutely harrowing. So with all of that in mind, that's how I'm taking forward the work that I'm doing now. Can I be absolutely clear that sexual harassment or abuse of any form anywhere is unacceptable and it needs to stop? I want to make that absolutely clear. That bullying behaviour as a result of sex sexism and sexual harassment and or assault are very different things and we have to be clear about that as well and the support needed for a young person who is demonstrating bullying behavior and a young person demonstrating inappropriate sexualized behavior is very different too and we must ensure that children and young people get the support that they need to address that so putting that on the on uh, on the table what are we doing to, to address some of it um, it, all of it, I, I suspect. Um, equally safe at schools uh, is currently being rolled out. We had a pilot, um, a couple of pilot areas running, one in a, a, a school in my constituency. Currently, 26,000 young people have gone through that process. The Sexual Violence Prevention Programme that comes along with Rape Crisis Scotland, the STAMP project, uh, along with Equally Safe, has now been rolled out just recently to all 32 local authorities. So hopefully that will address some of the issues around about what the difference is and how we can deal with that. Uh, the, the PSE review also has um, elements of um, training in there for how we deal with consent, because uh, again, that's another issue about uh, interpretations of what that means. Um, the resources that are available, there's many, many resources available, including the EIS uh, booklet, Getting It Right for Girls and Guidance for Teachers. But one of the specific asks in your question was about how are we recording this and how are we making sure it's been recorded properly. You'll know as a result of the, uh, this committee's inquiry, there was data collection and how data is used and the, the richness of that data was a, a key element of that. So we've taken all of that on board and CMIS, which is a data collection scheme that's used in schools in order to address this, will now allow schools to record any underlying prejudice or any negative behaviour reported as an incident of bully and bullying. And this includes an option to record an incident based on sexism and gender. So uh, let me be absolutely clear that there'll be opportunities now for um, schools to record that more accurately. We can get more accurate figures, which means that we can target our resources and our fo focus of attention uh, much clearer. But in the wider scope of things, in the new year, I will be launching a sexual harassment and sexism public awareness campaign. And that will be early next year. And there'll be a specific strand of that work with children. So I would hope that all of that would reassure your questioner that the work is, is ongoing and, and we're, we're taking it very, very seriously. 
it, it will have a, a thank you for that answer when you say it will have a, a specific strand on children i suppose that the thrust of the of the question is that um people may be concerned that naming male violence as what it is becomes diluted i mean certainly the the answers you gave you know showed that is not the case but would you recognize that concern that if we don't talk about violence against women and girls specifically that something might be lost um i suppose i suppose that that could be a legitimate concern but i i would go back to all of the other actions because it's not just one thing it's not just the anti-bullying strategy and bullying is a very specific thing and i would be a bit worried that we would actually dilute the fact that there's violence against women um, if 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 we we don't you know separate it out in that sense and that's why equally safe for the schools you know the sexual prevention stuff the consent education all of that work i think will reinforce the fact that we're absolutely serious that any form of sexual harassment it, whether it's in schools or out with schools is just not acceptable and we're taking actions to address it okay, thank you we have a couple of supplementaries um Mary Fee. Thank you. Um, Minister, you touched on the, the, the inquiry that this committee did when, when you um, were uh, convener. And you may remember that there, there was um, a, a kind of a, a, perce a perceived um, kind of thought that not every single um, incidence of bullying was being recorded um, because of the perception of stigma that would be attached to the school. Um, how confident are you that that has now changed? I mean, I accept you've, you've spoken about equally safe and, and all the work that's been done, which is really welcome. But if, if there is still a fear or a concern in some schools that they don't want to record everything, um, how are you going to go over that? Two ways. There's a whole school approach, which means that the whole school has to you know, change its culture. And we've seen some great examples of schools who, who, who did that. The, the, the other way is around about the inspection and um, a, regime so uh, in school so there's a bit of work being done which was a recommendation to the committee report which again one of my other uh, ministerial colleagues is, is leading on that piece of work and Marie Todd we, Marie and I seem to work together in a lot of things because they have that impact but there is there is a key piece of work going on around about that right now um, and it's her lead that's on it so I can get you some additional information on, on where we are with this but you will know that that was a recommendation from this committee's report and and the government are taking forward all of those recommendations so um, we'll come back to you and, and give you an update. Perfect. Okay, and finally, Alec Hamilton. Thank you, Convener, um, and thank you for the comprehensive answers you provided around this section, uh, Minister. Um, as you know, sexual harassment is a spectrum. It ranges from physical abuse to online grooming and exploitation. Uh, before I came to this place, I sat on the Ministerial Task Force on Child Exploitation, and I was the youngest person in the room, and that was something I raised at the very first meeting, and that's saying something. Um, can I ask if we've made progress in terms of involving young people who know far more about the social media platforms and the fora and the frontiers where they are most at risk than we as adults do? And what involvement are you using for them, not just in online sexual exploitation, but in the other policy areas around sexual harassment? Yeah, you'll, you'll not be surprised that the, the, one of the reasons why I commended the work of the Young Women Lead Project is that they're all over this stuff. The Scottish Youth Parliament are all over, over this as well, and the um, equivalent committee uh, to yours have, have raised uh, some very, very interesting work that they are doing around about the rights uh, campaign and how we involve young people. In the, one of the pilot schools, which was in my constituency, I went in one day for a meeting uh, for something else, and the the rights respecting committee um, of young people were delivering equally safe in schools to their peers. Um, so there's a lot of work going on where we think that peer education will be the key uh, to, to all of this. And, and that's, that's the approach that's being taken, is how do we make sure that we have relevant um, policy that's uh, informed by the lived experience of young people, and in most cases, delivered by young people. The sexual violence uh, prevention programme, uh, the pilots for that, the stamp project, was all run by young people, and they're absolutely uh, amazing. And some of them come here to some of the cross-party groups in order to inform the work that gets done here, uh, bringing that age ratio down absolutely very dramatically indeed. Um, 
So there is, I can reassure you, there is all of the work that we are doing across the board has involved young people at every single stage. And just last week in this room, uh, we had an Everyday Heroes event, which was young people who had been through the criminal justice system as victims and witnesses when it comes to domestic violence. And all of the recommendations that they made, they made to us last week have been taken on board and how we can improve that process for young people as well. So be reassured that young people much younger than you and I, Mr Cole Hamilton, are informing everything that we do. Good to hear. Minister, thank you very much for your evidence this morning and we appreciate you staying on a little longer than was planned so that we could get through all the, the public's questions. Our next meeting will be on Thursday the 13th of December where we will continue to take oral evidence on the Young Women's Lead Committee report on sexual harassment in schools from both representatives of the committee and the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, John Swinney. I now close this meeting and Mary Faye intimated to the convener that I wish to, to raise an item Okay. before you close the meeting. I didn't close it yet. <laughs> okay, okay. 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 Thank you. Um, I'm grateful to the convener for allowing me to raise this issue. Um, I would um, like to ask that the committee uh, reopens the evidence and scrutiny of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill, and I am asking this for two reasons. Firstly, the amendments that have been lodged by our colleague Alex Cole Hamilton, and secondly, the intimation that the UN are consulting on the age of criminal responsibility with an intention to raise the age to 14 early next year. And in relation to the amendments that have been lodged by Alex Cole Hamilton, the amendments would raise the age of prosecution to 14 and the age of criminal responsibility to 16. And committee will be aware that we took no evidence on the age of criminal prosecution or on raising the age of criminal responsibility specifically to 16. I do appreciate that we had some evidence from stakeholders that they would like the age to be higher, but we did not ask for specific evidence on 16. And it is my view in light of this that it is impossible for this committee to reach any kind of decision on these amendments. And as committee members, we have a responsibility to thoroughly scrutinise legislation which comes before us. And the power of this parliament is and should always be in our committees. And it is therefore incumbent on us as committee members to fulfil our obligation and take further evidence on the amendments submitted by Alex Cole Hamilton and fully consider the UN's intention to raise, raise the age of criminal responsibility to 14. Otherwise, we will introduce legislation that will already be at odds with recommendations from the United Nations. And let me assure committee, this is not about party politics. This is about us as a committee fulfilling our responsibility and obligation to this parliament. Thank you. Okay, Mary. Um You've put your, your views uh, publicly. Um, as you'll know, agendas have to be published in advance, so there's not capacity to take items on the record. They're not in the published agenda. The agenda is a matter... Um, no. something to vote if I'm not able to, to do Oliver that. Oliver I, I, I just wondered, uh, given the point that Mary Fee's raised, if it would be possible uh, to have a discussion... Uh, in private session uh, round the work programme and maybe take some advice uh, from the clerks. The agenda is a matter for me as convener and I suggest that we put this item on the agenda for next week. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, I close the meeting.